I'm, I'm tickled and honored to be here, uh, uh, quite beyond what uh, R Richard and all may say, partly because uh, each of you know far more than, <laughs> than I do. And so this morning, the vendors have noticed me sort of just leaning over their table, spying and picking up things. So um, rather than trying to tell you what is happening now, all of you are far more familiar with this than I am. Uh, I'll tell you what happened a million years ago when there were dinosaurs and brontosauruses and pterodactyls hanging around, uh, when, the, when the idea of computer security, the phrase didn't exist. Um, so uh, uh, to do this talk, uh, I, I went up in my attic and found some uh, what, what in the 1980s would have been called PowerPoint. These are, uh, um, these are view graphs, and the astonishing part about it is, unlike PowerPoint, you can actually pull it up and read it. And uh, this is a set of um, view graphs that I was invited in 1987 to do a talk at Fort Meade at the NSA. And they, in advance, said, we have these questions we want to ask you. Can you talk about this, this, and this, and this? But they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me walk in with my own view graphs because at the time they were paranoid, not that they're not paranoid now, but at the time they were paranoid that you could take a piece of acetate like this charge it electrically against a woolen surface, put it on top of a classified piece of paper, walk off with it, and then dust it with powder and steal information. And so the, 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 these, these view graphs were, are genuine NSA generated pieces of acetate that uh, I was able to walk off with. Hey, right, um, oh. oh, great, they're out of focus too, uh, focus. Uh, someone over here is going to come over and focus it for me, aren't they? <laughs> they're not going to walk. They're not going to walk down slowly. They're going to run quickly, aren't they? <laughs> and in focusing it, they will find that auto. Oh. <laughs> and in focusing it, ah, look at that! Astonishing, amazing. Hot ziggity, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you can walk back slowly now. <laughs> Zoom out. Um, I'll push auto again. Uh, um, anyway, this is, this is a talk that I gave a long time ago. At, and I was, I was at the time that I made this, the, jeez, uh, come on, zoom, zoom. Uh, the, the, the place I worked, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, had a rule which many of you all have in your displays and your vendor materials that you must have a logo on every one of your slides and so on. So now on the average you've seen a logo on each slide. Um, um, these, are, these are people that I mentioned from 30 years ago. These are the people who actually did the work. I'm claiming, I'm claiming credit for stuff that Marv Ashley, Bruce Bauer, uh, Joan Crafton. Um, these are people who, who I worked with 30 years ago. And they, they, of course, were the computer jocks and the smart people. I was just the droid in the background doing things. But um, getting to business, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm discovering these as I go. So, so it's, it's memory laneville for me. Um, well, um, what do you do when you find somebody breaking into your computer? What, what uh, remember, Remember, this is a talk from 30 years ago. I'm speaking to people at, who I assumed knew more than I did. And I assume now that each of you know more than I do. Um, what do you do when you find somebody breaking into your computer? Well, seems obvious. You disable his access. You make, sh you make sure that they can't get in. You, you cork up whatever holes you can find. You tell the system, systems people on it, and you don't publicize it. You keep your mouth shut because you'll get into trouble. So around August of 1986, somebody, I detected somebody breaking into our Unix systems at Lawrence Berkeley Labs out on the West Coast. And I didn't know any better. Nobody told this to me. So, so 
when I find an intruder, I let the bastard in. I leave the hole wide open. On the other hand, I want to monitor everything. I want to see what the connectivity is. I want to see what they're typing in, what they're getting back, what keywords they're looking for, where, they're, what, where are they going from here to there. Meanwhile, I want to trace things backwards. I want to find out, you know, what's, you know, what connects to what and who? You know, what, what's the connectivity? And to me at the time, the TCP IP, this, this was in the earliest days. And I thought, oh, if you want to track something, you don't track things by saying, oh, I'll look at its IP address. You track things, I want to find its electrical address. I, you know, it, it turned out I would take voltmeters and try to trace packets through routers and things like this. I didn't know any better. Nobody was saying, hey, that's a stupid idea. So on the other hand, Oh, did I do that? <laughs> I might have. Oh, can you figure out how to plug it in? Great. On the other hand, I want to make noise. I want to tell people about this. And did I do a bad? I want to tell people about it. It seems to me that it's our responsibility not just to watch out for what's happening on our system. It's our responsibility to figure out how to tell people in the field what's happening. It's my job. And in physics in, boy, I really screwed things up, didn't I? Oh, wow, great. So my apologies, guys. Um, So, as you can see, when, when you don't understand something, when you don't understand something, when, when you can't, when, when, when you don't understand what's going on, it's an opportunity for you and me to do basic research, to do physics to do what you are trained to do. And to me, this means you apply whatever physical principles you can come up with. Do physics. We do, do the science and do the very boring and, and rather mundane research that we're accustomed to. And at the time, in the 80s, this meant using the tools available to me, things like oscilloscopes, signal tracers and such and not. Um, uh, probably the most useful of these things and, and the one tool that I find still today unused is right here. You keep a notebook. I'm astonished at how few people write things down. And by writing things down, I don't mean you keep a log in the back of one of your Unix boxes. No, I mean your handwriting. Because, well, when I was at observatories, the idea was if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. It's one thing to collect a huge, a huge log, and it's another thing to have a system that will analyze this log, of which I had a delightful chat not half an hour ago with people who have built wonderful software to analyze logs and, and, and IP tables and watching for intrusions. And, but having done so, having done so, there's still a question of how do you, how do you actually How do you actually communicate this to others? It's necessary to summarize, think about it, and I find there's no substitute for a real long book. So having said that, I'll say the other things are you do your own homework. You don't let other people do your homework for you. 
it seems obvious, but everyone will say, oh, I want an answer. Nobody's going to help. So, would it help if I sort of wiggled this? I, I did a real bad thing. I'm sorry, people. Uh, um, uh, uh, you can get even later. <laughs> um, you, you do your own homework. You find new methodologies. You, you figure out things that you can do on your system that haven't been done before. Again, basic physics. You trust what you can prove. You ignore the rumors. You ignore the sense of, oh, I think it's so-and-so. You want to, it's, it's what you can prove, what, what your IP tells you, not what, not, not what you sense. And then finally, you publish your results. It's not enough to, it's not enough to do the work Come here and do a talk. Tell us. Tell me what's happened. Publish what happens. And finally, don't give up. Everyone will want you to go and do something useful. Security is not useful. Security gets in the way of operations. Everyone will tell you this, and yet you know yourself, security is operations. Security is step one. It's the fundamental part of building something rather than, oh, we'll make something secure after we construct it. So don't give up. It's your responsibility and your opportunity to do things. Oh, it came on for a moment. It went off. Oh, it's on. Great. Thank you. Oh, splendid. Otto? Come, please, please, please. You can finish my talk for me. Don't worry about it. I appreciate it. No worries. Well, I got my, I dug myself into the hole. <laughs> oh, wonderful, terrific. There's even light. Um, on the subject of, uh, it'll, it'll be here. Um, on the subject of, of publishing, it was. I figured early on I would publish an article in the communications of the ACM, uh, the communications of the Association for Computer Machinery, entitled Stalking the Wiley Hacker. And I thought this was all you needed to do, is present the facts to people and everyone else would learn from it. I had the bizarre delusion that if you told people the facts of, of what had happened to you, how somebody broke into your computer and how you caught them, that that would be enough to show and convince people that, oh, things are OK. Um, I was dead wrong, of course. Um, one of the more useful things is to actually speak to people and tell stories about what's happened. Um, for those of you who are considering speaking at SANS next year, tell a story. Uh, and if you'd like my opinions on that, ask me later on. Um, so still dead? OK, don't worry. Um, in August of 1986, I was a, an astronomer working on developing off-axis hyperboloids in a, for a large telescope that we're building out of Berkeley. And the project ran out of money. Actually, the project was funded, which meant that everything was going to get built. And upon building and construction, science was no longer uh, after things are built in, uh, after things started building, there was not much need for uh, physical astronomers to work on the thing. So I began working half time and then full time at the computer lab at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Our labs at the time had a handful of Unix computer systems called Spark stations, Unix Unix boxes, and a handful of larger systems, uh, which had. Uh, Systems like oh, IBM Time Sharing and Vax VMS. And I was there for a day or two when, a, uh, when there's a, uh, I'm, I'm there working with, with a bunch of, of, uh, of other computer jocks when a, one of them comes up to me and says, hey, you know, the accounting program in our, 
in our, at our lab just went dead, just went belly up. And it was by no means obvious what was happening, it was by no means obvious what was going on. It turns out, after a few hours of checking things out, that our, the physics department had hired a, uh, oh, wow, thank you. Um, the physics department had hired a, uh, uh, we'd hired a, an undergraduate from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, so we had a bunch of boxes connected together by ether with a bunch of modems, X25, the third Cisco router ever built uh, out to, uh, and the, when I say a Cisco router, this was three rack panels wide and it had eight ports on it. One of the ports went out to what was called the ARPANET, which went out over to something called the MILNET. All of these things, nobody's, nobody, none of you have heard of 2400 baud modems, none of you have heard of pocket pagers, none of you have heard of ARPANET, uh, you have. Uh, no, notice somebody with a gray beard has heard of that. Um, um, uh, you know, the, the MILNET, these are, Figments of history, the, 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 when, the, when there were brontosauruses walking around. Anyway, um, every time somebody used time on one of these machines, a packet would come down into a database where we would charge people nickels and dimes for use of, of time on the machine. And one day, this, uh, this database went, went dead in the water. So. I push auto. Look at that. Wow, hot damn. Um, so one day this database just was dead in the water. And uh, this, I tried getting hold of this computer freshman at Berkeley and he was gone. And I looked more carefully at his code and it turns out that um, a user over here, as I recall by the name of Sventec, had an account name on one of the Unix boxes and didn't have an account name on the accounting system. So, oh, this is interesting, what's, what's going on here? Um, and, I, uh, and I look carefully, it turns out they do not teach error correction until you're a sophomore at Berkeley. So, <laughs> it had never occurred to him to check to make sure that there was a valid account here and a valid account here. So I patched it, it turns out that we were losing on the order of 50, 60, 75 cents of, of money through this, but the real problem was that the accounting Thing was dead. So, oh cool, cool. Uh, I, 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 this is like going back in memory lane, so I'm, I'm sorry for the, the tangents, but uh, this was uh, speaking to the, uh, this is speaking to my, my uh, friends at the NSA 30 years ago. Um, for this research, we had no budget. Um, our entire computer security budget totally was one quarter of a full-time equivalent, meaning, meaning once a month somebody would write a letter to the, our funding agency, the Department of Energy, and say, we don't have any problems. Our hardware budget, the total hardware and software budget for this was, was zero, well, uh, corrected for inflation, zero million dollars. Um, uh, um, all of the funding came out of the overhead from our astronomy group, and there wasn't much overhead. This is so, and we'd rather be doing physics. Meanwhile, unlike people in the room, unlike you guys, unlike you people, we had absolutely zero expertise in any of this. So please, when you're sitting back saying, what a fool this guy was, realize that yes, I was a fool, still am, but uh, there was, none of the collective wisdom or even individual wisdom that you guys have back 30 years ago. We had no expertise, no experience in detecting anyone oops, breaking in. We can't publicize things. We can't go out over what was then called the Usenet saying somebody's breaking our computer because somebody will be listening and they may change their behavior because of that. We don't know what other people are doing because they shut their mouth. We have no mandate. Nobody says it's your job to track this guy down. 
You know, a lot of people discouraged us from continuing. The Department of Energy said if, if it gets in the, in the news that, that hackers are breaking into a DOE computer, we're going to cut, Congress will cut our funding, we'll double that number and cut yours. So, <laughs> what do you do when you're, yeah, what do you do when you're broke, when you're stupid, and when you're discouraged? Um, now, it seems to me, seems to me that that's the situation that we always find ourselves in. Think of your own experience. You never find yourself with too much money, being too smart, with a huge mandate. That never happens. There's no client anywhere who's going to fund you that way. In other words, you're doing the right thing. And the result is, you end up with rather primitive tools. You use a crescent wrench as a hammer. You use a screwdriver as a chisel. Your methodology necessarily has to fit in your budget. But you come up with creative solutions. You, you, you get people that you know to do things that, that are fun. So um, th this kind of summarizes what, what we, so yeah. What happened? We detected somebody deep in our machines based on a 50, 75 cent accounting error in our Unix boxes. Over a period of 11 and a half or 12 months, we monitored everything that the guy did. These were in the days of RS-232 serial line, so, and things called dot matrix printer. Yeah, yeah. Check this out, a uh, uh, TV camera, look at this guy here. Look, uh, zoom in close, look, look, see? Um, uh, he knows what a dot matrix printer is, like a deck writer, remember? Silent 700s on that flimsy paper, yeah. Um, so um, there was a time when this was possible to do it. So am I gonna mention this? Yeah, yeah, I'll mention this in a minute. Um, we printed out everything that he did. I mean, I wanted to hold him in my hand and find out what's going on. We watched him try to break into about 450 machines, and they were almost entirely American military and defense contractors. Oh, cool. <laughs> Damn. Um, um, at the time when I made this thing, the FBI kept telling me, don't say to anybody where he's from because we're prosecuting him. So I had to make this view graph saying, we traced him back to H. Uh, well, this meant Hanover, Germany. We traced the guy back to uh, an apartment in Hanover, Germany. A group of five computer hackers were breaking in. Uh, and we ultimately prosecuted and convicted this guy and three others. Um, we contacted organizations that we thought could help out. Our funding agency, the Department of Energy, which told us stop tracking him down. We contacted the FBI. I called up the FBI Oakland field office, right? Call up, hey FBI, somebody's breaking my computer. Somebody's screwing with my computer, so they're breaking my system. They're there. <laughs> I didn't do it this time. It wasn't, it wasn't me. I, I mean, so I call up the FBI, and the FBI is saying, oh my God, well, this is serious stuff. Somebody's bringing you, what are they doing? I'm saying, they're getting into military computers. They're going across the ARPANET. They're, they're TCP IP. They're going over the IP networks, 30 dot blah, 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 and 20s. And the guy says, oh my God, how much money have you lost? And I said, well, we've lost about 75 cents. And <laughs> guy, guy says, look, go away, kid. Come back when you've lost real money. And that didn't seem like fun. So over the next, it's back on, uh, over the next, uh, over the next six, eight months, we contacted every group that we thought could help. We called the NSA, the National Computer Security Center. Uh, we called anybody, Doris Day, B.B. King, any, anyone that, that we thought of, and the answer was always, look, um, we did our best to tell people about what was going on in the 
inevitable answer was, look, your, we would love to hear from you, and we want to read your log books and your reports, and please come out to Fort Meade and give a talk or three. But we certainly can't fund you. We can't do any help for you. Speaking to the NSA, I said, hey, I need a telephone trace across the Atlantic Ocean into Europe. And they, you know, uh, I, the guy says to me, I'm talking to this guy, and he says, look, I can't even confirm that I'm talking to you, let alone, uh, <laughs> let alone help you out. And so uh, I'll explore some of the ways you, you, you do this. Meanwhile, we analyze the things that the guy's using, and he's obviously looking for military targets and espionage. And we estimated uh, what the security was of North American computer stock at that time. And nominally, 1 in 10, 1 in 50, more than 1% of all systems that were connected to the nascent ARPANET were extraordinarily vulnerable. Uh, our reaction, well, our reaction at LBL, of course, was have a meeting. So my boss, boss uh, Professor Kurth, and Louis Alvarez, David Shirley, all these big shots. David Shirley was director of the lab. He not only had a beard, but he had a tie. So he was like important. And, <laughs> and like, we explained things to him. Oh, 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 oh. I sort of missed out on something. Okay, let's go back to where the, uh, do it by hand. Um, going back to this detailed diagram, um, it was, it became fairly obvious after a couple weeks that somebody was coming in through either our modems or X25 links into our, our local area network, and it turned out to be very, I, I was astonished at how difficult it was to trace our own local area networks. They are built to be undocumented. People who build local area networks, whether it's in their home, whether it's in their office, whether it's in an enterprise, whether it's, uh, they're made, they're designed to just barely work and not be documented. So I, w I was surprised at how tough it was to just draw a block diagram, the most simplistic diagram, even to understand it in my own head. Um, uh, so the question became one of, how am I going to monitor the 40 or 50 lines coming into the lab? And at that point, I took advantage of one of the very few things that I learned in graduate school, namely, it's easier to apologize later than to get permission in advance. So I went to I said, I'll wait until Friday afternoon. 5.30 Friday afternoon, I got one of these lab carts, you know, these push carts, and went from office to office at Building 50 up, on, up at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, liberating people's desktop computers and their printers and their deck writers and their silent 700s, and, you know, just sort of wheeling them over to the basement of Building 50 where the glass dinosaur, or the glass room where the dinosaurs were, and using clip leads from Radio Shack, another Radio Shack, does that exist anymore? Um, using clip leads to connect to the RS-232 lines on the back so that I had a bunch of printers that essentially were tapped onto the incoming lines, like about 40 or 50 of these. So from 5 o'clock till 11 o'clock at night, I was just going around wiring these up, clipping them, pins, three and one or something like this, the back of these connectors. And so that any time somebody came in over the weekend, I'd have a printout of what they were doing. I got out a sleeping bag, unrolled it, and thermos of minestrone soup, and um, fell asleep next to this VAX 780 computer that was built during the Civil War. And the uh, next morning, next morning, it's a Saturday morning, Roy Kurth, the assistant director, the, the director of the physics group, comes by and he kicks me out of the uh, sleeping bag and says, um, I understand that people are missing computers from around the lab. And I'm in a sleeping bag with 40 or 50 of the, these computers surrounding me. And 
I tell them the truth. I have no idea where they are. <laughs> and he says to me, he says, it would be a right neighborly thing if, if they were all returned. So I said, okay. So I pick them up, take them to this uh, little shop uh, push cart and roll them back to, to their respective owners, more or less. And, and one of them, what is, one of these things has a has like like 40 or 50 feet of printout coming out of it, paper rolling out of it, showing how somebody has connected through our modem bank over our ether into a Unix box, logged in, used a hole in cron used a hole in the post office protocol, uh, and coupled with crontab to become a super user, to become root, then to go out over the ether through our router, through our Cisco box, onto the ARPANET and break into a group at the Aniston Army Depot and start uploading information about missile tests and, and ICBMs and IRBMs and things like this. I'm watching this. I'm, I'm looking at this paper. I'm seeing all of this. And it's bizarre. I mean, remember, this is Berkeley. Uh, you might expect somebody to break in looking for granola recipes, but not, <laughs> not exactly uh, um, uh, missile tests and things like this. I'm saying this is absolutely weird. And, and, and over the next 10, 11 months, where's Jennifer? Thank you. Um, um, over the next 10 or 11 months, we watched this group of computer hackers routinely searching out military information, which, of course, is weird for me, having had no contact whatsoever with the military, which I'll probably get to later if there's enough time. But um, um, our idea was, so we have this meeting, and Dave Shirley says, yeah, somebody has, system, somebody has found root privilege, system-managed privilege on our, on our box. We can sort of understand how we're doing it. Let's catch them. It's got to be some undergraduate in Berkeley. Let's track them down um, and catch them. Take all the time, all the personnel, all the resources you need. Take three weeks if you have to, but catch the guy. Nail the bastard. And I'm saying, yeah, I got three weeks. Uh, so I built systems that today are laughably primitive. Uh, I got an old Hewlett Packard. Um, serial line analyzer, which would just watch, you know, it just looked for binary flips from 010101 and matched the 0101s to the ASCII equivalent of the passwords and accounts that this guy was using. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know we all have little buttons and tags that say, it, it's all just zeros and ones. Well, it was back then also. And so I just had the serial line analyzer sitting there on our ether watching for this, uh, these transitions, timing them. And as soon as it said, oh, I recognize a username or a purloined username or a password that's associated with these, it will immediately pull a mechanical relay, which you, there, there were once, once upon a time, there were electronics meant transistors and relays and things like this. And, and the relay in turn would uh, dial a mechanical device that would call a pocket pager and send a Morse code signal to a pocket pager. Once again, uh, no one knows what a pocket pager either, except uh, you. Uh, but uh, and he's about to retire. So again, this is. Um, um, meanwhile, we're printing out whatever he does. If there is danger, I'm going to disconnect him. If he types in something like RM remove all files or wipe our disk, I'm going to kick them off. We're going to increase backups to be once an hour and so on. We're going to notify the authorities. We're going to tell people, of course, we told the FBI, we'll notify other sites directly. I remember calling, I distinctly remember calling the Air Force Space Command in Los Angeles or San Diego and 
having a bizarre conversation with them, explaining to them that somebody was at the moment using their system and breaking into it, and the system manager saying, how do I know it's not you? How can I trust you? I haven't the faintest idea who you are. Meanwhile, correctly, I had no idea who this guy was. There, 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 was, there was a surprising difficulty uh, in, in communicating with others. Meanwhile, we want to keep things silent, to protect the users. And um, yeah, watching this one guy, we watched him try to break into several hundred Milnet machines, stolen network users. He'd kill processes, change data, and export files. He'd kill any auditing or accounting processes as he went. His idea was, I do not want to be discovered. Um, uh, he, uh, today, it's commonplace to talk about password cracking. All of us are familiar with it. I hadn't ever heard of this in 1986. It was completely novel to me that here he's cracking the most, you know, I'd never thought of passing. Uh, also, at the time, the Unix standard for the Etsy password file was to make the password file publicly readable without salt. It relied entirely upon a high quality hash function for password protection. And as as all, I assume all of you know, as, as I learned eventually, this is a stupid thing to do, but to rely upon a single level of defense for your most precious file. Um, we watched the guy build, build Trojan horses. Meanwhile, he's searching for what was in the mid-'80s interesting styles of, uh, of military keywords. And we watched... We watched this guy successfully break into a large number of what I thought at the time was a large number of systems, and it was a it was a challenge to get these people to cooperate, let alone coordinate their efforts with us. And uh, it was also challenging to actually define what do you mean by breaking into a computer? Is getting guest privilege interesting? Is getting system manager root privilege of importance? Is, is it important simply that you're able to read a few files or read all files? It, uh, the language for intrusion and intrusion detection didn't exist at the time. So early on, uh, I, I should go faster. I, I'm sorry, I'll try to run through this fast because the Interesting conclusions are coming up. Um, we trace things through our local area network through TimeNet, which was an X25 packet, uh, packet aggregator. Um, TimeNet to PacBell. Ti neither TimeNet nor PacBell exist anymore. Uh, we trace things from PacBell through AT&T long lines to a place in McLean, Virginia. Um, the place in McLean, Virginia turned out to be a defense contractor called MITRE, which was an offshoot of MIT earlier. And we had problems getting court orders. Our court orders in California to do phone traces wouldn't, were simply not valid within, uh, within Northern Virginia. Uh, eventually, we were able to convince, uh, we were able to convince the Virginia telephone system to help us out by simply talking to a network operator in Virginia and saying, hey, look, I need to know where this line traces back to the guy says, well, I can't help you out. Sorry, show me a court order. I said, I can't show you a court order because it's in California. However, I do have some wonderful pictures of galaxies and planets that come from my astronomy background. And the guy said, that'll do. And so, <laughs> uh, so I sent him a bunch of really cool pictures of Saturn and Jupiter and the Andromeda galaxy, and we found out that it was... Uh, MITRE, we call up MITRE, and MITRE tightens security immediately by simply switching off their outbound modems. Um, I'll get to the useful stuff. You know, this is the kind of block diagrams that you, you people are, uh, I'm certain, you know, some, somebody in Hanover, Germany, makes a connection over what was then the German t telephone service, calls up into a, a pad, a public access dial-up network, goes over to the Datex P network, Across, this, across through a satellite into a North American aggregator into our labs in Berkeley, then goes out over the internet, what was then called the ARPANET, uh, goes to one military computer to another to another, extracts information from this. Good luck if you're down here and, you're, and you detect this guy. Good luck trying to trace it all the way back. It takes effort and coordination and 
And it was a... Uh, So, um, in, in detail, we, it was necessary. The curious thing about all of these diagrams is not that they're of interest to you, but that it's necessary to make this kind of diagram when you speak to your customers. Because simply saying, oh, IP network 20.7.7.13 doesn't communicate the same thing as saying, oh, you are right here, friend, and the person's back here. There's as much as possible, simplify honestly, and make your point as visible as you possibly can. Uh, this, is, this made sense to my customers, who happened ultimately to be FBI agents and the sharper ones were literally fresh out of college. Um, so, you know, we, so meanwhile, um, we trace things from our labs in Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, to Bremen, Germany. In Bremen, Germany, at the time, Bremen, West Germany, um, uh, there was a microvac sitting in a librarian's office that had a connection to another computer in Hanover. And so a distance of uh, 150 kilometers between here and here, somebody had successfully converted this Bremen computer into an open enough computer that hackers could break in and use that to connect to North American sites and hide behind it. Uh, then at the Hanover public access dial-up pad, we were able to trace things back to uh, Hanover, Germany, um, but this was, oh, ah, remember, uh, none of you, none of you need listen, but he'll understand. Um, <laughs> there was a time, no kidding, there was a time when the word telephone meant a thing that was on your desk, and it was about you know, the size of a bread box or so. And there was a wire leading to it. The word wireless hadn't been invented yet. And, and to make a telephone call, to, is this true? Look, look, look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. Um, to make a telephone call, you'd put your finger in this thing called a, called a dial. Yeah, a ring. You'd put your finger in this thing, go zip, and go click, 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 click. Zip, click, click, click. No kidding. Um, uh, it was mechanical. <laughs> You should ask him. <laughs> he thinks I'm kidding. You would, you would make a telephone call by going zip, 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 10, 20, 30 kilometers away in downtown Hanover, there'd be solenoids and relays and little clicky things that would go zip, click, 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 zip, 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 zip. It was all electromechanical. There were no computers. I have no idea how the system worked. That, I mean, if it worked even, you, 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 you can't believe that. I know, I, I'm not, ask him, he'll tell you it's true. <laughs> and these things, you couldn't pick it up and walk around with it like this. You know, it, it was like 20 times bigger than this. It, it, in Hanover, Germany, this meant that to make a telephone trace, you had to do it in real time. Because when you hung up and disconnected, all the solenoids vroomp, went back to neutral. And to make a phone trace, you had to have a human being with an ohmmeter and a voltmeter and a, uh, and a notepad and a clipboard. And all of this took several hours to, to get to work. So we needed a phone trace that would take two or three hours to complete. And repeatedly, we'd discover the guy on our system, we'd call the FBI, the FBI would call the German, the German Bundeskriminalat, the Bundeskriminalat would call the uh, Deutsche uh, Bundes, Bundespost, and they'd send technicians out to make this trace, and by the time they got to the downtown Hanover telephone box, the thing had been disconnected. 
So we needed a way to we needed a way to keep this hacker connected for two or three hours. And how much time do I have? All I want, thanks. How much time do I have? Quick, quick. No, we can go into break a little bit. A little bit, but how much time do I have? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. Can I talk about this or should I skip it? You can talk about it. Okay, do it, okay, okay. This is, this is the only useful, so far everything I've told you is either obvious, wrong, or so antique that no one would, no one would care about it. So this is the only useful thing that I have to tell you so far. Um, and the coolness, oh, far out. The coolness of it is, some of you may have kids who are uh, at the age where they're learning to play chess, or better yet, some of you may be playing chess. And uh, wouldn't it be cool to win at chess? Wouldn't it be absolutely sweet to always win at chess? Would it not be wonderful to like, 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 always win at chess? And this guy, Arthur Bisquer, Arthur Bisquer is, I mean, he's not just your ordinary grandmaster, he's an international grandmaster. He has 10 tips on how to win at chess. He's going to teach me and you how to win at chess. And it turns out all you need to know is rule number two. And it turns out a, a division of mathematics, mathematical graph theory called game theory suggests strongly that Game theory is highly applicable in computer science, especially in the type of work that I see vendors doing. Things like uh, log analysis and, and uh, patch management tools. Game theory is a surprisingly useful tool in doing this type of thing. So, so think about that. Here's a grandmaster who's going to teach you how to always win at chess. And all you need to know is rule number two. Is that cool or what? <laughs> you want to win at chess, make the best possible move. <laughs> For those of you of the female persuasion, rule number four is also useful. So, so it was January of 1987 when I came across this, and my, uh, my sweetheart at the time, she and I were, did I mention this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the time, the West Coast was going through one of its periodic droughts, and she and I were conserving water together. Um, and in the words of the... In the words of the Oakland Tribune, um, Stolen and his sweetheart were in the shower together one day <laughs> when, when they came up with the answer that they dubbed Operation Showerhead. They would create a very large file full of completely bogus information about the topics that they knew the hacker was interested in. The time that he spent downloading it would give them, uh, would give the police time to track him down. We tried to make the files look really bureaucratic and boring. His girlfriend said, look, if we'd said, hey, this is classified information, the guy would have caught on right away. Um, the trick worked. Um, uh, the hacker came across the file and spent more than an hour loading it into his own computer. During that time, the German police were able to trace his telephone number and ultimately find where he lived and so on. Stolen and his girlfriend celebrated with milkshakes made from homegrown Berkeley strawberries. Um, so, um, essentially, we, this, you know, this, this is so cool to discover these view graphs from the, the last century. Um, um, we needed a one-hour connection. We needed this guy to be connected for an hour in order to make this mechanical phone trace. So we created files about this strategic defense initiative network. This was a big thing in the 1980s, and today has been completely forgotten, along with, you know, like... Uh, disco. Um, uh, 
These files about SDI network contain bureaucratic memos, vague descriptions of this utterly boring uh, phony military network, form letters, names of a non-existent secretary that happened to have the same mail stop as me. Uh, January 16, the guy broke in and read these files. These files were not world readable. Uh, you know, you set your permissions correctly. And we traced the connection all the way, we traced this particular connection all the way back to a particular telephone. I'm in the backyard, we're dancing around singing Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead, having a great time saying, I can go back to doing astronomy, it'll be all over now. But the German Bundeskriminalamt is clever. They're not like me, they're clever. They wait for a week. Oh, oh, um, oh far out. Um, this is the type of thing that we placed in our system. This is one of dozens of such completely bogus documents that we thought up. Each of you could do a better job of this. Remember, I'm just a physicist. Um, SDI Network Project, LBL Mail Stop 50351, one cyclotron road, Berkeley, California, 94720, name, name, address, state, city, state, code, country. Dear sir, notice the vaguely sexist, bureaucratic sounding language. Thank you for re-inquiring about SDI Net. We're happy to comply with your request about more information about this network. Uh, the following documents are available from this office. Please state which you want sent to you. Um, does anybody recognize the word more? M-O-R-E? Unix jocks, anyone? Today, this has been made obsolete and everyone uses the Unix command less. Uh, which is, uh, but this, uh, less is more. Thank you. Um, 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 so available on our if you write to us, is document 37.6, SDI net overview description document, 41.7, functional requirements document, 45.2, strategic defense initiative and computer network. In other words, this is the kind of bogus, this is the kind of boring bureaucratic crud that you'll find in every organization. And you generate it by taking the boring bureaucratic crud in Croft that's already in your organization and just tweaking it a little bit. I noticed, you know, for us, we had this interesting mapping function from academia into the military language. We had a genuine problem. Uh, we talked, uh, I talked a number of times to a guy named Jim Christie at the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, OSI. I had no idea who they are, what they are, what the initials stand for. There was a place called Bowling Air, F Bow yeah, Bowling's Air Force Base. And I have no idea whether this is where it is or what it is, and I don't know the difference between a colonel and a general or anything like this. Um, but there has to be a mapping function that will map it into my mind, and my mind has an academic bureaucracy starting at dean, working your way down to professor, to grad student, to undergrad, and so on. So all I had to do was take ordinary university documents and change professor into colonel and dean into general and uh, you know grad student into lieutenant. And it, it maps very sweetly between the two bureaucracies. And, you know, so blah, 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 blah. Um, because of the length of these documents, we must use the Postal Service, blah, blah, blah. Sincerely yours, Mrs. Barbara Sherwin, Document Secretary, SDI Network Project. This is the kind of crud that this guy downloaded. So the Bundeskriminalat sits and waits for a month, two, three months. And the guy keeps breaking into our systems. Then three months after this goes out over the ether into West Germany, a letter arrives. Kidding. A letter arrives. A paper letter. No, this is before email was common. A paper letter arrives from Triam International, 6512 Ventura Drive, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April 21st, 1987. Addressed to the SDI network mail stop, you know, LBL mail shop five, you know, one cyclotron road, Ber they misspell cyclotron and they misspell Berkeley. Um, attend, but it's, but this is my mailbox. 
Dear Mrs. Sherwin, I'm interested in the following documents. Please send me a price list and an update on the SDI network problem. Thank you for your cooperation. Very truly yours, Laszlo Bailo. And this guy's looking for document 37.6 SDI network overview description document, you know, 417. I'm looking at this and comparing it to, to, to the one that fell on the floor. And I'm saying, oh my God, all of the stuff that went over to somebody in Germany who's been looking for this military stuff is somebody in Pittsburgh with a Bulgarian last name is picking up on. So I did what you would do. Did exactly what you would do. I call the FBI. And so I call the FBI. And the guy at the FBI says, oh my God, whatever you do, don't touch that. Blah! <laughs> don't touch it because it's got fingerprints on it. Get an, eight, get an 11 by 14 glassine envelope, a pair of latex gloves, and go pick that. But no, 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 no. Don't pick it up from around the edges like an intelligent person would do. Pick it up by the middle like this because the fingerprints are around the edge. And holding it with your latex glove on, you're holding it like this, and you're trying to get into this envelope, right? You're trying, so you're going like, whoop, 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 whoop. And, and so you finally get it into this glassine envelope, you put it into a Federal, Federal Express overnight envelope, and send it to the FBI crime headquarters in Washington, DC. So. I'm, Bicycle down to downtown Berkeley, where the FedEx box is. I'm going along as fast as I can, and entirely by accident, I bumped into a Xerox machine, which is why I've got a copy of it today. <laughs> so, so uh, all of which, oh, cool. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, along with this packet of, of detritus in my attic came a note uh, that I scribbled, uh, all, all, all of which actually comes down to, hey kids, for mind-blowing glimpses of reality as it really is, don't miss the cuckoo's egg by Cliff Stoll, graduate of Buffalo Public School 61, published by Doubleday, the purveyors of the finest in computer counter-espionage books for the general public, on sale at most good stores and all crummy bookstores. Um, um, so much for a plug for the book. If you buy a copy of that book today, a nickel of that will go to my kid's tuition fund. <laughs> Which is to say, if you can possibly find it in your heart to buy 200,000 of them. Uh, <laughs> <you'll>, <laughs> my wife and I will be <laughs> grateful to you for the next several years. Um, 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 how much time do I have? Seriously, how many minutes? 10 minutes. Um, I, I'd like to show you a picture of my wife Pat and my daughter Zoe, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, instead, what I'll do is mention to you that these view graphs and so on, I made for a talk that I gave at the NSA in, in 1987, 1988. And there are a few, very few things to take away. One of them was they told me, look, we'd like you to do a talk, but we're not going to allow our audience to ask questions because we don't want you to know what we are interested in, which <laughs> sort of has some interesting epistemological <laughs> implications. So, um, so could you address the following questions? How was the penetrator tracked? Which so far I assume, all, I hope I've answered this. What auditing features exist? Well, the auditing features consist of a lousy 150-line C program that a freshman at 
University of California wrote, there's lots of holes in it. How do you audit somebody with system level privileges? This gets interesting, and I note that there are several vendors in the hallway that address this directly by auditing not what's happening on the system, by look, but rather by looking at what I'd call TCP, TCP dump Wireshark types of, of, of logs. Uh, and I find this, you know, but, you know, this is 30 years later. Um, uh, supply technical details on how to penetrate computers. How were passwords obtained for the Lawrence Livermore Cray systems? How were super user privileges obtained? Did the, priv did the penetrator guard against detection? These were questions asked of me 30 years ago to give a talk on. Well, I saw these questions and I found you know, they want me, an academic from Berkeley, to go to Fort Meade and give a talk on this and I found I found the questions to be damned offensive, but not for the obvious reason, for a much more subtle reason. There's something wrong with each of these questions, and the subtle problem with each question, I implore each of you to ask of yourself. What's wrong with these questions is not their content, but rather their phraseology. Each of these questions is a morally neutral, passive voice question where the active party is hidden, where the active question itself is obscured. Once you recognize that and you say, oh, let me rephrase this into questions that make sense to Cliff, you get things like this. How does this bastard break into computers? What systems does he slither into? How does this scoundrel become super user? How did the son of a bitch get the Cray computers? Did this skunk guard against detection? Do, how do you are audit a varmint who's system manager and how do you trace an egg sucker back to his roost? In other, in other words, this is the kind of question, this is the kind of question I can understand because it implies a moral and ethical question, that there is indeed in our life and in our profession a right and a wrong. Without, by erasing the concept of ethics and morality and evil, you get this kind of moral neutral gibbergash that, that we find so often in PowerPoint. When you're asking this kind of question, you stay up, when you're asking that kind of question, you check out, you check in at 9 a.m., you check out at 5 p.m. You're asking this, you're in a sleeping bag on a Friday night with a thermos of minestrone next to you. And of course, all of these lead to the obvious question, why do we still work on this problem? Why do we care? And to me, this is the point, this is the torch that I feel is in each of your hands because it's no longer in my hands. We care because we're members of a community. And it's a community not bound together by databases. It's not a community that's bound together by knowing how Python scripts use dictionary lookups. It's not a community that's, that is bound together because, oh, we know how to do this intrusion detection, we know how to uh, do Wireshark. No, it's a community tied together by common interests of promoting the free or the not so free transfer of information legitimately between our different individuals, our different organizations, our different companies, our different universities. This is our responsibility. This is who we are. This is who we should be. And for that reason, I implore you to use the active voice in your universe because you're in it. When you write things, when you speak, use the word I, use the word me, use the word us. When you hear passive voice, of course, all of us know, when you hear somebody speaking in passive voice, it's a way to dodge responsibility. Enough said there. Um, I'll just go over, you know, how does he 
break into computers, it was obvious, you know, where did he get into, blah, blah, blah. You know, how did he get this? You know, he reads command files, you know. Hey, guard against detection, yeah, you know. All of these, all of you know, you know. Why do we still work on this problem? Damned if I know. Um, I'm a physicist. Your job, peoples, if you're doing the job right, if you're doing your job right, I'll never hear from you. If you guys are doing your job right, my system is secure, and it's secure transparently to me. I don't have to stand my, and I'm on my head and enter three levels of passwords and have my cell phone go beep. No. Quality security is invisible to an ordinary user like me. Thank <laughs> you.